Thank you. 
Szanowni Państwo, cieszę się bardzo, że spotkamy się dzisiaj w tak licznym gronie, aby wspólnie dyskutować o erze cyfryzacji w sektorze finansowym. To nie jest śmieszne. Chyba czas, aby przejść na język angielski, ponieważ już widzę po niektórych twarzach naszych gości, że zastanawiają się, czy aby na pewno znajdują się w właściwej sali. Zanim to nastąpi, chciałbym podziękować Państwu z Waszym ojczystym języku. Bardzo dziękuję. Switch to 
to English, uh, you will get the joke later. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Maxime Lagrange, you can read uh, on the slide. I am the center head for HSBC Global Banking and Markets IT for Poland. I will translate into human words. Um, we are the technology team here at Krakow supporting the investment banking division of HSBC. On behalf of my HSBC colleagues, uh, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for being uh, with us today. And also, we'd like to welcome you to the third edition of Disruption Banking event. Quite a special one, if you ask me, uh, simply because uh, it is mostly powered by HSBC that I have the honor to represent today. I'm pleasantly surprised to see uh, so many of you um, showing interest in such an event <coughs> and topic. Uh, that's very refreshing, uh, very disrupting. Um, but before we get started, um, I'd like to express my sincere appreciation to a few individuals who have helped bring this event together. I know for some of you it's the boring part, but trust me, without these people, this event wouldn't happen. Uh, first and foremost, um, I'd like to uh, get a special thank uh, to Disruption Banking Team. Fiona, Shimon, and Andrew that couldn't make it today, and the entire team behind it. Thank you very much for, for, for your work. <laughs> I'd like also um, to respectfully thank the fantastic speakers, some of them coming from far, um, so you will see, I hope you will enjoy, enjoy the content of, of the presentation. Secondly, and selfishly, uh, I'd like to thank my HSBC colleagues. It's bonus time, so it's the right time. <laughs> Um, my HSBC colleague from marketing and communication teams, uh, both locally, and a special thank to Kasha. Kasha, if you're here, just wave. <laughs> thank you. And I know that working with me can be a challenge, so thank you for, for handling this. Um, this wouldn't happen with, uh, without the joint effort of our GSC Krakow colleagues, and especially I'd like to uh, address a thank to Marcin Wojcik. So I don't know if Marcin is in the room, but thank you very much for your support. Um, and I'd like also to thank my central uh, team communication and marketing colleagues, London-based, uh, who are with us today. So Matt Duggan, the head of communication, uh, thank you very much. And as well, Tim Smolchik from Strategy. Uh, also, quick work from, uh, to Tim Hitchin that couldn't make it today. So Matt, Tim, uh, I know you are in the room. So if you could please stand up and wave, you deserve to be very well known in Poland. I'd like to use the occasion uh, to extend a special welcome to our guest of honor, uh, Richard Herbert, uh, Chief Information Officer of HSBC Global Banking and Markets. Thank you so much for traveling all the way down from London via Ryanair. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, we are very pleased to welcome you in Krakow. Uh, last but not least, uh, I'd like to thank Ron Pike as well, uh, the Global Head of GFX, uh, who's been the ambassador of the site at MT level and uh, gave all his leadership support uh, for this site. So, Ron, thank you so much. <laughs> I've been currently asked and told that I should not take too much of your time. Um, I hope that uh, today will be fun and full of uh, learning and at times thought provoking. So, a very, very warm welcome to each and every one of you. Uh, if you have any questions, I just want to continue some of the topics that we're going to touch base after during the presentation. You can catch up after during the networking session right after the event. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, let me welcome our first speaker, Pete Towns, HSBC IT Global Head of Digital, DevOps and Architecture. He will, <laughs> yeah, that's a long title. <laughs> he will talk to you about how we deliver digital products for investment banking HSBC. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, unfortunately, my Polish isn't very good, so you're going to have to listen to me entirely in English. Uh, so it's great to be here, and I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you a bit about what digital and disruption means for us in investment banking. Uh, so let's talk a bit about the word digital. It's a big buzzword in the industry right now. It's kind of high up there on the, the Gartner hype cycle to the point where it's got its own hype cycle. So. Um, 
really digital, what does it mean? And I think you have to provide the context of digital, uh, specifically in our case, to our industry and investment banking. Otherwise, it's so generic, you can't really talk about what it means when you're delivering digital type products. So before I kind of dive into how we deliver digital products at HSBC, let me give you a specific example of how a product has evolved in an investment bank and moved from being not digital, analog, to being much more of a digital product. So I'm going to talk specifically about trading foreign exchange. So the foreign exchange market is an enormous market that is traded globally around the world to the order of trillions of dollars. And there was a time, not so long ago actually, a few years ago, where the way in which we would transact foreign exchange looked a little bit like this. It would be a fair corporate client, maybe they want to, I don't know, maybe it's a car manufacturer in Japan and they're buying metal, uh, steel perhaps from China, they need to take a foreign exchange transaction <coughs> as part of that process flow. So they would pick up a phone and they would call a salesperson in the bank at their desk and they would ask for quote and a price. In this case, in, this would be yen renminbi. Uh, what would happen is the salesperson would then shout to a trader across the desk and say, quote me a price in to a certain amount that the client asked for. The trader is then looking at a set of screens. Often it's in his head and he's looking at the market data flowing. He's looking at his position. He's got it in his head in a lot of cases. And he's figuring out the right price for that customer and for the bank. He then shouts that price to the salesperson. And in a really active market, he could be shouting that every second. 45, 45, 46, 46, 45. When the client says done, because the salesperson then relays that price to the client, the, cl the sales guy says done to the trader. So then what happens is, if the trader's really busy, he may not key that ticket in at that time. He may keep it in his head, he may write it down on the blotter. And when it's a quieter time of the market, he may then start keying those trades in. Okay, so the trade's now been captured, it's in the risk system, it's now flowing down for settlement, because ultimately that results in a cash flow between us and the client. Again, it could be in those days that the systems, and they didn't really talk to each other particularly well, uh, it could be that when that trade is booked, it doesn't actually flow through to the back office teams for, say, confirmation. So it could be that it goes to an operations team and have to figure out potentially whether there's the right settlement instruction on that transaction. And ultimately, that could take hours, it could take days before a client potentially knew that their trade was done done. And they would actually then get a phone call saying, can you confirm that the trade that you have done is the trade that you have done? So that's how it used to be a few years ago. Okay, so this is how it's changed dramatically. For a corporate client now, what we would do is that we would send them a URL which links to our portal where we trade RFX products, right? So it sits on a client's desktop, they would launch our trading portal. They then click on the uh, FX tab. They see a bunch of ticking rates for the currency pairs that they care about. Those ticking prices are ticking all the time. They are live. We are streaming market data to them that's executable all the time. Uh, fundamentally, if you think about how many clients, how many currency pairs, how many ticks, that's hundreds of thousands of ticks going through our systems at all time. The client will then click to trade. Immediately, that trade books in our systems. Now underpinning that price is our e-trading world. We have algos which describe our prices. We take market data in, we use our algos to provide a price. That price looks at things like our inventory, the positions that we're carrying, it looks at market data, it looks at different ways of giving the most competitive price to our clients which we can best risk manage all the time, constantly. When they click to trade, that deal is booked immediately. We've got, we're on a bunch of validations to make sure it's okay. It goes down through to the settlement platform and immediately goes to our post-trade portal where our client can automatically visually confirm on their screen. The salesperson gets to see that the trade's booked in their blotter. They can mine that information to find out about that client and what the trades that they're doing. It may be this is the first time this client has traded yen. That's a really important data point. We should talk to that client about, are they actually trading more and more yen deals? The trader, at this point, doesn't need to worry because our e-risk systems, our e-trading systems, are managing this entirely in an automated way. So we've gone from being an incredibly manual, phone-based way of transacting to being completely and utterly technology-focused. 
And all this technology is technology that we build in HSBC. And it's really important to stress just how far we have come as an industry and the fact that the technology we're building has to scale across, in our case, 60 countries around the world, <coughs> across a whole series of different types of clients, across a number of different venues. It's absolutely vital that this stuff is running and providing pricing and providing execution day and night for our clients. Okay, so I think it's useful just to give you a view onto that sort of thing. So really we've gone from being quite manual, uh, not really scalable. If a trader's quoting, how many times can they quote? We can now quote multiple clients simultaneously throughout the day and night. Uh, often it's error prone, right? So back in the day, it could be that a salesperson, when they talk to the trader and call the price out, maybe they misunderstood that price and we keep the wrong deal. That's error prone. We don't get any of that now because it's all automated. All the way through our systems, we're capturing each time that trader is going through the, through the pipes all the way through the settlement. So the level of control that we have now is far greater than we ever did. Okay? So it's useful to write context in an investment bank. So in that context, how do we do digital transformation? Now, again, let's go back a few years. Often in large technology companies, we would uh, run projects, multi-million dollar projects that we fund. And those projects are run by having Gantt charts and project managers are looking at those Gantt charts and we focus a lot on milestones. Doing that, of course, is that you become so focused on projects and milestones, you forget why we're here. Why we're here is to deliver value and to deliver value to our business and our clients as quickly as possible. So originally when we kicked off our digital program a few years ago, we looked at this fact that we were rolling out our projects in this way, and we said, this doesn't make any sense. In particular, it doesn't make any sense because we've got an amazing relationship with our business. We have a very intimate and close relationship with our business. So why would we have this kind of project mentality where the business would say, deliver this, this set of requirements, and we then come back in a few minutes time and say, here they are? Because it might be wrong. We might have mis misinterpreted it. We might have been delivering things that don't have value. So we've really, really thought and reflected on the importance of moving away from these large project projects and programs with long dated milestones towards delivering value, because that's what we're here to do. So one of the things that we did, we'd be really, really obsessed about release cadence. And by that I mean, how quickly are we pushing code to production? Now, a lot of teams talk about the fact that they do agile. And often teams do agile when they're not. Because what they're doing is they're maybe doing Scrum, but they're just doing two weekly releases to UAT. There's no value of code in UAT. You can't monetize it, you can't ship it, you can't provide those features to your client. So we're obsessed about shifting from delivering in UAT in small cycles to pushing those changes to production. That's a really big challenge. It's a really big challenge because in order to make changes happen more regularly on a more frequent basis, you need much more control and much more automation in how you're pushing change. You can't do it manually. You have to start to use a real CI/CD pipeline and push those changes and those tests. Equally, there's a real danger, I think, in trying to push these large production changes on an irregular basis, because they're big and they're batched. And more often than not, when you push a big change to production, it's gonna break production. So if you start to break down your changes into much, much smaller pieces, you're able to ship them more regularly. There's a smaller blast radius of that change. You can do your testing around that one change, and you can start to ship much, much more regularly. So as you start to increase your release cadence, not only are you delivering value more quickly, you're delivering it more safely. You're delivering it in a way which doesn't break production. And of course, when you're digital, you can't be in a position where your production systems are down. At any point when your production system is down, you're not servicing your clients, you're not building revenue. So it's critically important that when you're releasing change, you're doing it frequently in a way that doesn't break production. The other thing that we focused on was the importance of really working closely, as I said, with our business partners. And the way that we think about digital now is less so there's the business and there's IT. We talk about having one team. And that's absolutely vital. 
because ultimately as technologists we have a huge understanding of how we build systems that are scalable, production quality, that deliver value at, at pace, but ultimately this is about ensuring that we're delivering true business value for our clients and our business. So one of the things that we do very frequently with our business counterparts is run retrospectives. Retrospectives are really, really important because we want to build trust between our technology company, where our technology department builds, and how the business gets its value to production. So when we found we started doing retrospectives, we started to understand more about what the business needed, and the business built more technology empathy and understanding about what, what we needed to do in technology. We gathered more business empathy from a technology point of view, and the trust started to grow. And we're now at a point where if you sat down with us and then sat in a retrospective that we ran, you would have no possibility of determining who the business person was and who the IT person was. It's one team. And that's how you start to get real value delivered when you have that really strong partnership. And we do have a great partnership with our business. So, over the last uh, three or four years, we've been applying these principles around release cadence, around reducing our impact production, about making our releases smaller, about retrospecting. So we're thinking about how we're delivering more value more quickly and how we're learning and getting better and better. And the system I talked about at the start, where I mentioned that we have this client portal that we deliver to trade foreign exchange, that system right now within HSBC, we currently do 40 releases a day, that's four zero, a team of 100 people, about 80% of that team are doing the releases to production. There's no separate production team. It's one team, you build it, you run it. And 90% of those releases are, do, are done during the week. And that's not during the week outside of trading hours, that's during trading hours. This platform runs from Monday morning Australia time to Friday night New York close. So what's vitally important to me here is, is that yes, we need to be building digital products. That's vitally important for our future. It's vitally important we provide our clients with a better service, more self-service, a better platform. But equally, we have to think about digital in terms of ourselves in technology. We'll never build the products that we need which satisfy our business and our clients unless we are digitizing ourselves and our IT processes. And that's what we're focused on. And for me, the value is, is astonishing. And really, I think it's, it's really impressive to see how far we in HSBC have taken these methodologies and really applied them in the field. So, thank you very much. Product Director for Fural Security, uh, they created a premier solution used by companies such as Yahoo, National Netherlands, Santander, and many more, that lets you control all the suspicious activity that goes around your company. He joined us today to tell us about the control measures for financial transaction systems. Okay. <coughs> software myself, and I'll have challenging one can be. So 40 times 40 and more. So congrats on that. So today I want to talk to you about control, because investment banking moves a lot of money, right? So that money goes into, usually it's a wallet. So a short thing what we do, we do security, we do control. We manage trust. So com company has been a while. We have been mostly based in Poland and US. And the vault that used to look like this, right? So the money goes in, then it's locked down. Now these days, vaults look more like this, so it's all digitized. I want to talk to you about controlling all of that, because it's all run by autonomous systems and automatic. So automatic and autonomous is kind of synonym these days. So they're run by themselves in, my, in most cases, and yet they're so complex, and there are so many things going on at the same time that you cannot really 
monitor all this uh, infrastructure and all these services manually. It has to be automated because you cannot keep up because the scale goes up really fast. So what do we do? We digitize vaults all together. So everything is database these days. And database is just a bunch of numbers that someone puts in. And then we take action based on those numbers. And these actions have, in many, most cases, financial repercussions. So the key question is, is the data true? Because all this data comes in. I mean, big data has moved us from statistics to analyzing everything, from everyone, from everywhere. We can do that. We have capabilities of doing that. But that means more data, more processes, more conclusions that we have to take. Question is, do we have time to verify this? Because these systems talk to each other, and in most cases, if the system talks to one to another, systems don't really care if the data is true. Because in most cases, if they integrate it, it means it's supposed to be like that. That was the design behind it. So the question is, do we, can we trust all this information? Because if, if you're the trader, you're the director, you're a person of influence, of decision maker, and you based you base your decision on wrong data, that's false on you. I mean, you can fall back on the systems, but if the data is wrongly and, uh, insert to present different outcome, you, you will take a different uh, decision. So we also have this notion like the threats can be from within. So we have this myth of rogue employee, which in most cases I call it a myth because I don't think people in most cases are stupid enough to mess with their jobs because most people love their jobs. That's why they do it. That's why we're hired for. They take they base their family well-being based on their jobs. So it's not their best interest to mess with the jobs they were intended to do. But all the people are doing in digital worlds are done by accounts. So a person can be an account. In, re in reality, he may not, because it's fairly easy to impersonate someone. These days, all we do is digitize. If one account is connected to another, Hacking just one opens the door for many more. And then may happen that, like, epic hacking of Macron, that was the journalist who wiped, he got his all <coughs> memories of 10 years wiped in front of him because someone hacked his Apple account just for fun, because they could do it. They had no real gain from it, but they could just could do it. Someone did it. Exploit the logical flaw in the notification system and wiped the entire thing. So the employee does not mean that account representing that employee is actually representing all the actions that an employee took. Because it's not, so in some cases, these accounts can be automatic. One system talk to another. It's not really an, uh, a person behind it. It's just a system, but someone may be tampering with that system. So we need to know if we can rely on all this information that so who is a privileged user? Essentially, it's a person of control. So account that can do something, except like regular user, is a privileged user because it has ability to manage something. So manage means change in a good way or in a bad way. So the threads of privileged sessions. Uh, session is like every connection that is made to the database or essentially any resource every session may carry some changes. I mean, uh, these 40 deployments a day, it's every time it's a session, right? So it needs to be tightly controlled. And the user of um, doing these uh, changes, it has to have a lot of uh, rights. It means they can do a lot of things. Of course, in, in most cases, we want all these changes to be for the good. Of course, sometimes bugs, bugs happen, it, but what we don't want is someone from outside with wrong intentions get a hold of privilege account because they can do a lot of harm. So we are providing um, control measures for these privilege accounts. 
all the accounts should be tightly monitored and they should be managed in a like least to know. It means if someone does not need to have access to a certain system, they shouldn't have it. Passwords should not be known. I mean, password is actually a thing of the past. We are in the uh, era of machine learning, so we are also on the wagon with our AI to provide uh, automatic profiling and behavioral analytic, analytics. So it means that even if someone will impersonate you from the digital standpoint 100% means has your login, has your password, has your contact token, it's fairly difficult, actually next to impossible, to impersonate a person in a way that you type on the keyboard. That's, even if I know you, I cannot really impersonate the way, the way you type. It's like the retina. I cannot impersonate that. The same way when you move your mouse. It's very easy to build a profile as you look if you use system long enough, it builds on your profile and it's e fairly easy to say if this is really you or someone using your device. Because you went for a coffee and you need to go your station. So the solution is our uh, food pump system that records and analyzes every session that is being made. Essentially that's the system that works as a gateway. It's like a server. So it all it sits right between people and content data and essentially any data, any type of database, server, mainframe, whatever, can be monitored to the system. And the system is working in a multiple configurations. So essentially what we want is user access company data in a controlled way. So we have actually a video file for every session. And this video file can be reviewed later if everything went, went according to the process and was supposed to someone uh, with normally is doing something else some, uh, suddenly wanted to register it. For what purpose? That's easy to trigger automatic response and notification for the security officer. So that's why control can be an automatic control can be achieved by AI, which is good AI, not this kind of, kind of AI. So business advantages are obvious because we can provide uh, forensic analytics for incidents backtrack whatever happened, you don't have to figure it out. It's kind of the same way that you have a huge uh, office building with, with uh, monitoring or without it. If there is one, people behave because they know they will be watched. If there is no monitoring, good people can do whatever they want that they deny whatever happened. Also, uh, that provides a uh, company with the compliance tools. You can actually enforce any policy. Uh, it can give access to certain resources and banning certain actions, like you can uh, forbid, reboot, shut down, withdraw, change, these type of commands that can be executed only by very few people. We even provide tools to manually approve every session, even from authorized users. So there is a control every step of the way. So actually, that's it from my, from my side. If there are any questions, I'll be later available. Thank you so much. exciting and terrifying piece of technology. Um, but thank you. Uh, now is the first of our networking and coffee breaks. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I'm definitely dying for a coffee. Uh, if my, I'm going to apologize in advance for any Polish names that I mispronunciate over the course of this evening. I, if my accent hasn't tipped you off already, I am American, and uh, there's a lot of things wrong with America, today especially, <laughs> but there's a lot of things that are great as well. Some of the technology that we're talking about today originated from the United States, and you know why? So cheesy, but it's because they champion a can-do attitude. It allows great ideas to turn into reality. It allows people to see doors where others can't yet. And almost just as importantly, it makes a difference between walking by an opportunity and grabbing it. So I don't say this often, but I really, I would love it if we took an opportunity to take a leaf out of America's book and use today 
as an opportunity to network. Say hi to someone, ask your neighbor what they thought of the presentation, or why they're here. Um, grab coffee, grab a treat, and uh, be back in 10, 15 minutes time for the second half of this. Thank you. Right now. 